So a case of an 86-year-old man, as you can see, has CAD and aortic stenosis and he's dyspneic. He presented to uh, the, our emergency department. He'd had dyspnea exertion for a few days. Also had had left shoulder and left arm pain for 24 hours, or in the last 24 hours, and some palpitations. Uh, his past history was significant for four-vessel coronary bypass grafting 16 years before this. He had chronic AFib and was anticoagulated with warfarin. He had type 2 diabetes, systemic hypertension, and also had a history is having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. On physical examination in the emergency room, uh, this was his exam, and he had the uh, three out of six uh, systolic ejection room at the right upper sternal border, as you can see. Uh, S2 was said to be normal. Carotids weren't mentioned. Uh, his electric cardiogram was relatively unremarkable, except for the atrial fibrillation and some nonspecific repolarization changes. This is his chest x-ray. Uh, it's a portable, so we have to be careful about judging the heart size, but it does look like he's got atrial enlargement at least. And in terms of his uh, labs, he had uh, normal uh, CBC and INR, and, and creatinine was okay. Uh, he, because of the chest and arm discomfort, troponins were uh, tested. These are the uh, sensitive troponins, and they were both elevated, but they didn't have a delta at two hours. And then you can see that his pro-BMP level was markedly elevated. So he had invasive coronary angiography, and th these were the findings. You can see he had 80% distal circ and 90% in an OM uh, branch. And the sequential graft to LAD, uh, his LAD diagonal and obtuse margin was patent. Lima graft was normal. And there was a Y graft to the distal RCA from that that was occluded. So he had PCI to the distal CERC, and it was successful. I'll just list his medications for completeness. Of course, he was started on uh, clopidogrel, clopidogrel after the PCI. And we'll look at his echo. So I'll just go through this. LVOT zoom, and this was the best we could get in uh, short axis here of his aortic valve. Here's an apical long. And then we, we as we can talk about in the uh, breakout sessions and so forth with aortic stenosis. We go to all of the transducer positions, and you can see right parasternal, right supraclavicular, suprasternal notch are illustrated here. Apical gave the uh, most complete uh, information, the highest velocity information, so that's what we used. And averaging, he, he's an atrial fib, so we averaged six beats. Uh, he had a, a mean gradient of 20 millimeters of mercury, and that should say that, yeah, the TVI was 60 centimeters. And then in atrial fibrillation these days, uh, based on some data that our colleague, Dr. Nakomo, is, uh, has collected, it's also important with atrial fib to report the largest mean gradient. Oftentimes that may be more reflective of the severity, but in this case, there wasn't too much difference between those two. And he did have findings that would support high filling pressure. And then looking at his four chamber, you can see the marked by atrial enlargement. Remember, he'd had this diagnosis of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Certainly his ejection fraction looks good. He's got some mitral regurge. That was quantitated, and it was uh, actually quite small amount. And then he had tri has tricuspid regurge, which is obviously more significant. And we'll look at his inferior vena cava hepatic veins. You can see some reversals there, and you can see reversals in the PW pattern here that are in systole. So severe TR. So this is the report so far. And the question is, what with the current information that he has, how would you grade him? Mild aortic stenosis? mild to moderate aortic stenosis, moderate, severe, or indeterminate. Okay, so we've got nobody with mild, but then there's 
and 34% say indeterminate. And that's, that's the correct answer at this point. So what other hemodynamic measurement do we need to decide that question? Well, we need a measure of flow, right? Because the gradient isn't just determined by the degree of valve narrowing, but it's also determined by the amount of flow across the valve. So uh, these, we use stroke volume, and of course that will then give us the valve area, which is the other important piece of information we need. And uh, uh, as far as the current measurement of flow, normal, high, and so forth, we use the stroke volume index. So uh, of course we measure the LVOT diameter, uh, we go to the left ventricular outflow tract. We uh, place the sample volume not too close to the valve or we've got aliasing, so we back off a little bit. We get our LVOT signals. We average a bunch of them because he's in atrial fibrillation. And we end up getting a valve area of 0.88 centimeters squared. So this was the final report adding the valve area in. I just held that back for the purposes of discussion. And as we look, he had had serial uh, studies at Mayo. He had been followed. He's, he was uh, local. And uh, you can see his ejection fraction was almost always preserved in the course of this. His uh, mean gradient actually was only 16 in 2018, but his valve area at that time was 1.1. And then gradient goes to 20, goes to 20, and his, but, but his valve area is going down. And uh, you can see that his stroke volume index went down, and that's why the, the valve area is smaller. So now with that information, what does he have? Yeah, I clicked the slide at the same time, but yeah, he's got severe. So he's got normal EF, low flow, low mean gradient, severe aortic stenosis. So he had the PCI, his dyspnea improved, he didn't have any further angina, but he estimated that his energy level was only about 50% compared to a year before. The clinician that was uh, seeing him had him undergo an oxygen consumption uh, treadmill test, and he did have, he, he went pretty far on the treadmill, but he did have pul both pulmonary and cardiac limitation. And so if we look at this, this phenomenon of the low um, mean gradient, low flow, severe aortic stenosis. The factors, if you get this kind of data like we have for him, you know, typically with normal flow, you'd be ha looking for a mean gradient greater than 40. The factors that increase the likelihood that this is truly severe aortic stenosis are, elder are, are explanations for why his ventricle wouldn't generate normal flow. So elderly patient, physical exam consistent with severe AS, uh, these patients tend to have hypertension uh, and, and may have left ventricular hypertrophy. Some of them, particularly women, have small cavities, and that explains why they can have a normal EF and a relatively low stroke volume. We're increasingly doing uh, strain on these patients. They've been found to have typically or often have reduced strain. And then if they have significant hypertension during the echo, that can minimize the gradient. So it's always important to take the blood pressure into account at the time of the echo. And then if, if uh, to really, if, if he had super severe, um, first of all, they have to, if they have low flow, if they have normal flow as defined by greater than 35 cc's per meter squared, they can still have this phenomenon because that's not a perfect measurement of flow, but if it is less like his was, uh, then that heightens the likelihood that it's truly severe. If the valve area is really low, like less than 0.8, or the mean gradient is even higher than his was, then that makes it certainly uh, very likely that that's what we're dealing with. Well, there's some recent papers that come out looking at another measurement of flow, which is the flow rate, volume per unit time, and that's the stroke volume divided by the ejection time. And in this paper uh, that I've put the slide in your in your uh, in the presentation, that, so you'll have it. This is really nice where they looked at this in a population of patients with aortic stenosis, including those with low. Uh, this, this same phenomenon, and they found, and of course the two uh, possibilities are that you've got truly severe aortic stenosis and a ventricle that won't generate flow against the valve. You've got a cardiomyopathy and the valve just isn't opening because the ventricle can't perform well enough to open it. So what they did was they looked at the flow rate across the valves of these patients, and then they did a statistical titration to see how low could the flow rate be and still have the aortic valve area be an accurate predictor of outcome. 
and they found that the lowest they could go was uh, 210. So they recommended that 210 cc's per second is the optimal cutoff. So that if you have that, it's an additional measurement. It's easy. You just measure the ejection time. You're already measuring stroke volume. Then you can be uh, more confident that the valve area of 0.88, which is below one, is truly severe aortic stenosis. Now, in his case, he came close, 204 cc's per second, but that still leaves a little uh, a doubt in our mind. And so, uh, interestingly enough, during the workup, he's being worked up at this point in time for a transcatheter valve, a pyrophosphate scan that was positive for TTR amyloid. He had um, high uh, light chains, and his ratio was up. So those two are kind of opposed to each other in terms of the type of amyloid. His creatinine was normal. He had no uh, amyloid on fat aspirate, and TTR gene testing was negative. So anyway, he's got something wrong with his, with his myocardium that explains the low flow. But the other thing that we do in these patients, and they automatically get this if they're going for transcatheter valves, but I, almost, I always do this in my patients that, have, that are in this situation, is uh, uh, send them off to CT for an aortic valve calcium score. And his was above 2,000, also noted to have severe restriction of the motion. And this is, uh, in, in men, greater than 2,000 is typically severe, likely severe. For women, you can see the cutoffs lower. And if you have uh, very likely, if it's greater than 3,000, and as you can see, if for a man, if it's less than 1,600, then it's unlikely AS. So he did have transaortic uh, valve implantation, transfemoral, and his echo uh, showed, we'll just go for the, for the follow-up here. So the, the, uh, val his valve area, his mean gradient, of course, across the valve goes way down. That's what we wanted. His, his valve area goes up. Why did his valve area go up? Because his stroke volume index went up. Look at how the ventricle it was able to improve its systolic performance by taking the afterload of the valve away. So he's one of these lucky people that has a hef-pef ventricle. He's still going to have problems from the hef-pef ventricle, but we've taken away the factor that was limiting his forward output. I don't know if there are any questions there. And again, we can go over some of these techniques for measuring gradients and so forth in the breakout session. Is there any? I was, yeah, go ahead, Soren. I was going to add a, add a comment, if I may. So on the list of the, the factors that favor aortic stenosis, add atrial fibrillation to that, put it at oh, the top yeah, of the list. Yeah, good point. Uh, so, so we looked at atrial fibrillation patients versus sinus rhythm patients, and this is again work by Vui and Como. Um, it's amazing how late we diagnose, we diagnose uh, severe aortic stenosis in AFib patients. They have a lower stroke volume, um, and that's the reason they have a low gradient. It's frequently overlooked. And the second thing is, gosh, trust your eyes. You look at that valve, you have to show me it's not severe. You don't have to demonstrate it's severe. Show me it is not. So, so it's important to remember that. It looks severe. It has to be severe until proven otherwise. 